Okay. Let's begin. In the name of our loving God, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Thank you. All right, just relax. Feel grateful to be here. Just drop your shoulders, let go of your worries. Just be at peace for a minute. Just let's listen to the sounds around us. Thanks, God, for this beautiful day, for getting us up. Thanks for the beautiful people that we are with right now. We look forward to your message and to your meal. Please give us the energy that we need for the coming week so we can improve our city and make our world better. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reader today is Lou. <laughs> that doesn't look like Lou. <laughs> April. <laughs> April Lou. <laughs> Myra just asked me to help Lou, so I'm April. Our first reading is from the Book of Wisdom, the ninth chapter. Who can know God's counsel, or who can conceive what God intends? For the deliberations of mortals are timid, and our plans are likely to fail. For a perishable body burdens the soul, and the earthen shelter weighs down the mind that has many concerns. We can hardly guess at the things on earth, and what is within our grasp we find with difficulty. But when things are in heaven, who can search them out? Who has learned your counsel unless you have given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? Thus, the paths of those on earth were made straight. This is the word of God. Now you get Lou. <laughs> In every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. In every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. You turn us back to dust, saying, Return, O children of mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday now that it is past, or as a watch of the night. In every age, O Lord, you have been our refuge. You make an end of them in their sleep. The next morning, they are like changing grass, which at dawn springs up anew, but by evening wilts and fades. In every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain wisdom of heart. Return, O oh Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. In every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. Fill us at daybreak with your kindness, that we may shout for joy and gladness all our days. And may the gracious care of the Lord our God be ours. Prosper the work of our hands for us. Prosper the work of our hands. In every age, O Lord, you have been our refuge. In this second reading of a letter of Philemon, you will see right away why I was chosen to do this reading. I, Paul, an old man, am now also a prisoner for Christ Jesus appeal to you on behalf of my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I should have liked to retain him for myself so that he might serve me on your behalf in my imprisonment for the gospel. 
but I do not want to do anything without your consent, so that the good you do might not be forced, but be voluntary. Perhaps this is why he was away from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a servant, but more than a servant, a brother, beloved especially to me, but even more so to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you regard me as a partner, welcome him as you would me. The Word of God. May God be with you. Thank you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If any of you come to me and do not hate your father and mother, spouse and children, brothers and sisters, and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. If you do not carry your own cross and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding yourself unable to work, all who see it would laugh at you and say, this one began to build, but did not have the resources to finish. Or what ruler marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops they can successfully oppose another ruler who has 20,000 troops. But if not, while the opponent is still far away, the ruler will send a delegation to ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not renounce all your possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, a little rain last night, a little chill in the air. Welcome back from summer. People always say to me, how is your summer? And I always say the same thing every summer. It's fantastic, because I love it. It's a great time. But this summer was a little bit different for me. I spent a lot of time this summer reflecting on where I am at this stage in my life. And I made a big decision. I made the decision to leave my position as associate pastor here at Spiritus Christi. And I know it is a big decision for you but, and for me, but I do know it's the right time. I began by thinking about the past 36 years here and also at Corpus Christi, reflecting on all the things that we've done together I remember when I first came to Corpus Christi, I was 28 years old, the age of my son, John, who's here today, John and Matt, Jim and Amber, yeah. I really have to thank them because they've provided so many stories for my homilies over the years, right? <laughs> but I was 28 years old, and I came and had great teachers. I had uh, Father Jim, who at the time was 35 years old, so a lot older than me, yeah. <laughs> but he did teach me how to focus on what's important and how to trust God to take care of everything. I remember when he was hiring my husband and I, he said, well, how much money do you need for a salary? And I said, well, it really seems like you really don't have very much money here. And he said, oh, we don't. He said, we don't have any money. He said, that's why you can ask for whatever you want. I also had Sister Margie as a teacher. She was developing Dimitri House into an outreach for the homeless. She taught me to always be enthusiastic and happy about what I was doing. And if I wasn't, then it was time to leave it behind. I had Kathy Quinlan as a teacher. She opened Isaiah House, a home for the dying. She taught me how important that stage is in life and how to walk with people through it. There was Jim Smith, who was beginning the prison ministry, which is still going. And I remember he asked me for a 10-year commitment at a time when I thought two years was really a long time, so. 
I worked with Mimi Youngman to develop our religious ed program, and together we started the Christmas Eve Nativity Play, which still goes today with Mark and Siobhan Potter leading it. And my husband Jim and I worked with parishioners to develop a strong family ministry with marriage preparation and family programs and strong structure for the church so that it would continue to grow. It was a very exciting inner city Roman Catholic parish where the poor were welcomed, the mission was strong, and everyone was included. What an amazing experience it was. But then came 1998 and a huge upheaval for all of us. The hierarchy clamped down on our inclusiveness, our innovations, our outreaches. How could we have a church where women preached, where non-Catholics were given communion, and where gay people were married? It was preposterous, unheard of, a threat to the way that things had always been. And so we who had housed the homeless found ourselves to be homeless. And we who had included others were now excluded. And we who had given communion to all were now excommunicated. But there's an old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's exactly what happened. We all got stronger. Each one of us had to individually count the cost of following Jesus and following our hearts. As Jesus says today, if you're going to build a tower, think about what it's going to cost you before you build it. And indeed, it would cost us. It would cost us relationships and family problems and all different things. But when you follow your heart and listen to what you believe in, you can also know that the whole universe is going to come alive and lift you up and guide you in your path because now your spirit is in control. And so it began again, a ragtag group of 500 people that met for a day in January 1999 and decided to continue being church together. In six months, we had formed Spiritus Christi, moved into the empty space at Salem United Church of Christ, and begun our first outreach, the Grace of God Recovery House, which this month is celebrating 20 years. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. God had a lot more for us to do right away we could welcome more people into our church without hesitation or secrecy, gay, lesbian, transgendered people. Right away everybody could come to Jesus' table for communion, and women could be priests, but that, that wasn't right away. That took us three years to figure out how to do that. But in the end, on November 17, 2001, just two months after 9-11 had happened, we packed 3,000 people into the Eastman Theater, blew the roof off with the music, and the liturgical dancing, and the joy. I was ordained a priest that day, but it was not my ordination. It was our ordination. A day of standing up and saying that we believe that both men and women are called by God. And many more women priests would follow, including Reverend Denise Donato, Reverend Patty, Reverend Hava, and Reverend Myra. In that moment, it was a big deal. It was even scary. But now, kind of normal. There's a saying that when the first one goes through a door, people say it can't be done. When the second one goes through the door, they say, I knew it would happen. And when the third person goes through the door, they say, this is how we've always done it. And that's what we say now. This is how we always do it. This is who we are here at Spiritus. We're not afraid to try new things, to experiment. I would a million times rather try and fail than never try at all. And we have the courage and the faith here to keep trying, to be creative, to use our talents to transform hopelessness in this world into new beginnings. We have done some amazing things here at Spiritus. There are too many to list all of them, some of my favorites, opening a hospital in Bourne, Haiti, 
opening Jennifer House and Nielsen House for men and women coming from prison, giving them a place to live in, establishing a mental health center, supporting young people in Chiapas with scholarships, training 50 buddy readers to go to World of Inquiry School and help children to read. We have four awesome choirs here that sing for us and the larger community. We have a senior high youth group of over 40 kids that just spent a week in New York City serving others. We have an anti-racism training program and a community project to build a civil rights park. And we have a Mother Earth community that patiently keeps training us how to take care of the Earth. In this parish, we have a heck of a lot of fun. We have a golf tournament today for grace of God, and Reverend Myra is going to golf. Is that funny? That's going to be really funny. <laughs> Can't wait to see that. I love to go with the, on the youth retreats and participate in the skits. We even designed an 1872 coffee shop. We have a lot of passion. We've supported the farm workers' rights and marched for them at a rally for the children of immigrants at the border. And there are many, many touching moments. First communions, listening to a nine-year-old's confession, seeing a visitor to our mental health center come out with a smile on their face, preparing a funeral for someone's father or daughter or baby, celebrating weddings, watching the kids in the nativity play, and always Easter morning. I know that this parish is in good hands with Reverend Myra as pastor. God is using her to open our hearts in new ways. And I know that that's an incredible staff that is here. They have taught me more than I've ever taught them, and I will miss them very much. At Spiritus, there is so much talent. If I were ever to start my own business, and I am not going to do that, <laughs> I would want all of you to go with me, because as a leader here, there was always somebody to ask for help. An accountant, a lawyer, an artist, a musician, a dancer, a seamstress, a decorator, a teacher, a medical person, an airplane pilot, a businessman, a chef, a photographer, an organizer, a writer, a mechanic, a carpenter, a painter, a social worker, even provider of Zweigel's Hots. Those are just some of the people that I have asked for help over the years. Every one of us should know by now that if we believe it, we will see it. The power we have to bring love into this world, the power we have to heal this world is only limited by what we can imagine and what we can commit ourselves to. We know that from our experience. So there was so much to think about this summer, and I took the time to count the cost, to plan, to think about what it would mean to leave Spiritus Christi I went on retreat, wrote in my journal, talked to my spiritual director, and I asked myself questions like this. What am I most afraid of about leaving here? Wow. The meaning here, the purpose, the inspiration. But the thing I was most afraid of was losing my relationship with all of you. As a priest, I have such an easy way to connect. I see you every week. I can be there for special moments in your life. We can share about deep things. And so I had to think long and hard about how I will keep that, those relationships and how I will treasure them and, and work on them in a different way. And then I asked myself, what am I most afraid of if I don't leave? And I realized what I am most afraid of is missing this time with my family. I don't want to miss it, and it's very, very important to me. 
Recently, I was in the grocery store with my grandchildren, Jace, who's now five years old, and Julia, who's two. As we were going around, a prisoner came up to me and she said, Hi, Reverend Mary. And I said, Hi. I said, This is my grandson, Jace, and my granddaughter, Julia. So she smiled at them, and Jace looked right at her and very sternly said, Her name is not Reverend Mary. Her name is Marmy. <laughs> we have a lot of names in our lives, right? As a child, I was Mary Annie, and then I was Mom, and as a teacher, Mrs. Rammerman, for the last 18 years, Reverend Mary. But now, for my grandkids, I'm Marmy. You might be Mima, or Nana, or Grandma, but in my house, it's Marmy. And I need time right now to be the best Marmy I can be. When Jace and Julia arrived, God gave me a new mission in my life to be their grandmother. And I take that very, very seriously. My own grandparents were important to me, even though they lived a few hours away. My grandmother taught me to cook, to embroider, and very important things like how to decorate a table for Thanksgiving and how to properly dry the silverware without spots. My grandfather loved music, and he would sit in the living room for hours and listen to me play the piano. He never had something else to do. I want to be there in the same way for Jace and Julia. These next few years are very precious, and I know that. I want to listen to their stories, I want to bake cookies with them, go on hikes and read books, paint pictures, sing songs, and cozy up with Kermit and Teddy Bear and Peppa Pig. And I want to be there to support their parents, Matt and Jenna, who are busy working, cleaning, doing laundry, cooking, transporting, and a million other things that young parents do. I have the time, and at this point in my life, the patience and the desire to babysit or cook dinner or clean up the dishes while Matt and Jenna catch their breath and snuggle their children. It's very important and I don't want to miss it. I also need time now to be with my husband Jim. He has always supported my ministry at Spiritus even though he worked during the week and I always worked every weekend. He's a wonderful man. He's very fun. I don't know who's more fun sometimes, Jim or my grandson, Jace. It's about the same. <laughs> I need that time with him, and I don't want to wake up some morning in the future and say, darn, I wish we'd had that time together. I also have two other children and their loves of their lives. Kristen, my daughter, and Joey, and my son John, and Amber. And even though they are grown-up people now, I still feel that I have an important place in their lives. And finally, I need time for my siblings. My brother Bill, who I'm very close to, has early Alzheimer's, and he is such a treasure. I want to have time to tell more stories and laugh with him, to support my sister-in-law in his care. He lives in Maryland, so it's a weekend trip to be with him. But he has a lot to teach me right now, and I don't want to miss it. So it's time for my mission in life to change. My priorities will be different for the next few years. I will still be a priest, even though my focus is changing. Like all of you, I want to keep growing spiritually. Reverend Myra and Father Jim have invited me to come back and preach a few times a year, and I would love to do that. I'll be kind of like Mike Boucher, you know, he sits up here in, in the balcony. <laughs> Every once in a while he flies down and gives a homily, so it'll be the Mike Boucher model. I may lead a program, or celebrate a funeral, so please don't die without telling me that you're going to die. <laughs> I will be in the wings to help out. 
And I think this year that I will follow the seasons. In the fall, I will let things die back. In the winter, I think I'll go dormant. And in the spring, I'll be ready for new creativity and ideas. In John chapter 6, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you also want to leave me? And Peter replies, Lord, to whom would I go? You are the one I want to be with. And that's how I feel about Spirit Christi. This is my church family. I don't really want to go to another church. I'm not sure another Catholic church would really want me either. <laughs> My husband Jim and I have always gone to church together and always will, so we plan to keep coming here. I hope you will welcome me in the pews and get used to me sitting out there. I'll be up here through September, and then you'll have to move over, make a seat for me. Most importantly today, I want to thank all of you, each one of you, for your love and your support for the last 36 years. You are each very, very important to me. I cannot tell you enough how much I have treasured being part of your lives. I thank you for trusting me with your hearts, with your ideas, with your joys and your sorrows, your families and your friendship. I love you dearly and always will.
the strength I need. 